What's crack? Big dogs. Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to the headquarters. My name is Nicholas. This is BDG. Big dogs got to eat. And this entire week is all strategy shit. All right. I know a lot of y'all's drafts are coming up uh, rather, rather soon. I need to let y'all know what the fuck we're doing in fantasy football drafts, right? There's only, there's only so much player analysis you could do. The must draft running backs and the fucking guys to fade and all that, all that, all that. This is all strategy week, okay? And I realized yesterday's video was confusing, so we're going to do it differently this time around, okay? Yesterday, uh, we're breaking it down picks by picks, okay? Depending on where you're drafting in your draft, in your fantasy football draft, we're going to do strategy for each section of the draft, okay? So yesterday's video was picks one through four. Today's going to be five through eight. Tomorrow's going to be nine through 12. And yesterday, basically, I did a mock draft on sleeper and I picked from the third spot and I basically went round by round went through the strategy and different strategies you can take if that's where you're picking from however I did it as a super flex format where you're starting two quarterbacks and as we went through it you know I explained what I would be doing differently if I was in a one quarterback league and a lot of you guys didn't take kindly and I want to put on record I'm not fucking doing it for you one quarterback pussies out there okay I'm doing this to make it a little bit less confusing for everybody because I realized it was a little bit confusing the way I went about it because you can't actually see the draft board how it would shape out as I was explaining the different strategies so for all you guys that are like super flex fucking stinks why don't you go back to your fucking sandbox fucking just get a it's only super flex here but today we're basically I've actually done five mock drafts today okay we're not gonna sit here and do a mock draft I'm going to pull up the five different mock drafts and we're going to go draft by draft explaining the different strategies that I chose to do in these leagues in the middle picks. OK, so picks five through eight. We took different spots in most of the drafts. I think I took the 107 in most of them just to give it the most clear identity of uh, of what the middle rounds or what the middle picks would be for you guys. So we're going to do three one quarterback drafts and then two super flex drafts, which I've already done on the sleeper app and we're going to go strategy by strategy you know one of them we did like wide receiver first and then a couple running backs the other one we did a running back first or two running backs or three running backs first the super flex ones we went quarterback in the first round then running back you know etc etc so we tried a bunch of different strategies today i'm gonna let y'all know my thought process through all five of the drafts we will put time stamps for y'all just so if you're only in super flex leagues maybe you want to jump to the other ones but i think you'll probably learn a lot regardless of uh what kind of formats you're in but i hope this video helps y'all out i really think this is going to be the most important video of the summer for a lot of you guys so if you do find it informational valuable entertaining for whatever fucking reason make sure you hit the thumbs up button and subscribe to the channel if you're new we want to hit 60k by the time the season kicks off we actually want to hit like 75 80k but i don't want to you know under undersell over deliver business 101 okay so make sure you're following us on the socials or me on the socials but more importantly make sure you subscribe to the channel tomorrow we will be doing picks 9 through 12 strategy yesterday we did one through four so check that out if you already haven't all that being said i'm almost ready to go but y'all know the routine we must first tuck our shirts in we must stop yelling let's eat <laughs> All right, so let me minimize myself. I'm going to get the socials off the screen. So again, make sure you're following me at Nick Ercolano on Instagram, on Twitter. Put me in the top right there and let us continue along our path. All right, so this is a one quarterback league, as you could see. The strategy I decided to go with was running back early. You guys know I'm a big advocate of taking running backs early, taking running backs often and filling up those slots because the positional scarcity is real. And it's hard, you know, the league winners are the ones that the running backs have finished the season with 20 plus fantasy points though you want to shoot for as many as those guys as possible okay so we're sitting at the 107 and listen i can't be perfect i can't have a fucking perfect mock draft where jonathan taylor goes off the board at the late second round whatever this is this is as close to realistic as i as i can possibly get for you guys so sitting at the 107 i think there's a realistic chance probably unlikely but a realistic chance that a guy like zeke falls to you if not i probably would have went with aaron jones so if i'm in the middle if i'm in the middle picks five six seven eight uh the first strategy i went with was running back in the first round and i want one of these guys i want cook kamara c mac derrick henry ezekiel elliott aaron jones i think with one of the first eight picks you're probably going to get one of those guys and you guys might say no i know how my draft is going to go i'm not going to get one of those guys don't worry there's a strategy uh in one of these drafts where i do take a wide receiver first so you'll have uh, a more crystal clear look at what's more realistic for you guys okay so we we took zeke at the 107 and we're going bike around and we're sitting there at the 206 
And I know that I love to do double running backs. And that's what we wanted to try out for the strategy. Because what I think is most helpful is doing a bunch of different strategies and then looking back at the draft when you're done and seeing how much you like your team. And I've done enough drafts to know that when I start off with double running backs, you double up, you grab those two guys, your team ends up being a lot prettier than if you don't do that for a few different reasons, which we'll explain in the other draft. So we ended up going Zeke. We ended up going Najee Harris. Again, this is more strategy. This is not player related. If you like Clyde more than Najee Harris, go for it. If you like Dobbins more than Najee Harris, go for it. And you could say like, I can't believe you took a guy like Najee Harris over a guy like Calvin Ridley. Again, this is strategy. So we took Zeke. We took Najee Harris. We started off with the two running backs. And you can go with Gibson, Eckler, if he falls to you there. It's going to be tough to get two running backs if you are in a one quarterback league because they go off the board so early and so often. So we took Zeke. We took Najee. We got some thick backs going. We start to venture into the third round. And we see all the top running backs are basically off the board. Obviously not taking Josh Jacobs there. We're not taking Miles Sanders. If you want to make the argument for David Montgomery, cool, go for it. This is going to depend a lot on your league settings in terms of like the starters in your league. The way fantasy football is set up, and I cannot relay this point to you guys enough, the way 99% of fantasy football leagues are set up right now, wide receivers positional value, wide receivers value is so, so, so secondary to running backs, to tight ends and super flex obviously to quarterbacks it just doesn't make sense to reach up for wide receivers because once you get past Devonte adams stefan diggs those guys i'm telling you the, the the mid to low wide receiver ones just don't perform that much better than the middling guys if you start two wide receivers right say your lineups are two running backs two wide receivers two flexes you have very little incentive to start to to grab wide receivers because you can there's 80 wide receivers to choose from that you can throw into your fantasy lineups there's not 80 running backs there's like 35 running backs maybe that you feel comfortable doing so so when you only have to start two wide receivers you're going to be able to find guys off the waiver wire no problem put them into your lineup so it makes no sense to jump up to grab wide receivers earlier on so when we're sitting there at the three seven you guys know i'm not an advocate for early tight ends this year because all of them are going a little bit too early for my liking. Like Travis Kelsey in the first round, not something I want to do. He falls into the second. Cool. Uh, Darren Waller should be the second tight end off the board. He ends up dropping to the third tight end. If Darren Waller falls into the third, I'm cool with it. In the second, I would rather grab an elite wide receiver. I would rather grab a running back with league winning upside. Okay. Darren Waller falls to me at the three, seven. My choice is between Darren Waller and like a middling, you know, like a low end wide receiver, one high end wide receiver two. The next guys off the board were Allen Robinson, Julio Jones, Mike Evans, and give me the positional advantage at tight end. You know, a very, very scarce position over a guy like Allen Robinson, who's going to put up 12 fantasy points per game and not move the needle whatsoever for you. So it was an easy pick for me at Darren Waller. That's really my take when it comes to tight ends. I'm not taking one of the top three guys unless they fall to me at value. Kelsey in the second, Waller in the third, Kittle in the fourth. That's where I am willing to pull the trigger in. Next positions we can talk about are wide receivers and quarterback. Once you get to the four six. The reason we go with running backs early, the reason I really like the strategy is because once you get to the middle of the fourth round, there's really no running backs worth taking, in my opinion. Kareem Hunt, Miles Gaskin, Travis Etienne, Melvin Gordon, Javante Williams, Mike, like Mike, da like those are not guys you want to be drafting in the middle of the fourth round when you have upside wide receivers. Uh, had Darrell Henderson fall to me there, I would probably think about it. You know, as long as you could start four running backs, I am fine ripping off three to four running backs in your first four to five rounds. I'm completely fine with it. But Terrell Henderson got picked around uh, pick before me. And you also see the quarterbacks going off the board really, really early too. In yesterday's video, I was talking about how if you have an early pick, right, picks one through four, I'm completely fine taking Kyler Murray at the end of the fourth, early fifth round. Because I think this is a stat that I've said to you guys before, but before he injured his shoulder in week 11 last year, his weeks one through 10 pace was literally on pace to be the single highest fantasy scoring season of all time more than Lamar Jackson's year more than Patrick Mahomes big year and it wasn't even close it was like by four or five points per game like that is difference making in one quarterback league and super flex league but they're starting to go earlier and earlier so I'm not going to be taking a quarterback in the third round I'm probably not going to be taking a quarterback in the middle of the early fourth round that's where we have to do it if you want to reach on Kyler go for it. I'm not going to hate you for it because it's not like Lamar Jackson last year where you had to get him at the, you know, the 211, 212, 31. It's more so 45, 412, something like that. So then I just started ripping off middling wide receivers that can fill up my lineup and and feel good about it. We went CD Lamb, we went Tyler Lockett, we went Brandon Ayuk. I don't think there's real value at tight end in uh in these kind of formats. If you're playing in a premium league, like here's the thing, like again, wide receivers, the reason I'll start drafting them in the fourth round is one, there's no positional scarcity. If you start if you're in a league where it's three wide receivers and two running backs, it makes it a little bit more valuable, but still doesn't put a premium on them. If you're in a league that is tiered PPR, I think I think what we're gonna see is a shift in the overall 
main scoring settings in fantasy football over the next few years. I think the overall goal of fantasy football should be to regulate, should be to normalize every position. Every position should almost be as valuable as the next position. The way fantasy football leagues are set up right now, running backs are still king, man. Running backs are the are the positions and the players that win you leagues. So until the majority of leagues start to shift their focus to having more starting wide receivers, having tiered premium uh, PPR where it's, you know, 0.25 for running backs or 0.5 for running backs, one full for wide receivers, 1.5 for tight ends. I don't think we should see a drastic dip in going wide receivers off the rip early and often. So we started drafting them in the fourth round. Lamb, Lockett, Ayuk, and I love that. I love those as my wide receiver one, two, three. Yes, they're probably all wide receiver twos, but I'm okay with that, right? When you don't draft one in the top three rounds, you're probably not getting a solidified wide receiver one. I could see any of those three guys finishing as a, you know, wide receiver 10 to 12 finish. I could see Lamb being the wide receiver 11. I could see Lockett being the wide receiver 12. I could see Ayuk being the wide receiver 14. So completely fine with those guys at my wide receiver position. Again, early wide receiver twos, like wide receiver 12 to 15. There's just no difference in points per game between them and wide receiver, you know, 25, 30. Uh, well, we hit seventh round. Here's where, you know, you could start looking at a quarterback in your one quarterback league you want to be shooting for upside at the quarterback position. As you can see, I waited until the 11th, 12th round to pick Trey Lance. And Trey Lance is a guy I'll be targeting really, really heavily in one quarterback leagues. I don't play in them, but for you guys, that's what I would be doing. I went with Damian Harris as my running back three. I love him in the seventh round. Antonio Brown, I will be scooping fucking everywhere. I don't know if you guys have been paying attention on Twitter, but Antonio Brown is is bowling at training camp. Absolutely fucking bowling. One of my bold predictions, I think he I think he might finish as a top 12 wide receiver this year in fantasy. I really, really do. I suggest you get as many shares of him as possible, especially while God, Godwin and Evans are going three to four rounds earlier than him. I just, I just don't. I just don't understand. He came in halfway through the year. He came in as a wide receiver three, playing limited snaps, and he was fantastic last year. In the eight games that them three played together, Antonio Brown tied Mike Evans for the most targets out of those three and led the three in receptions. Scored six touchdowns in his final six games. Brown is like the easiest eighth, ninth pick I've ever seen. And this is exactly where my argument for drafting your handcuff comes into play. If I grab Zeke in the first round, if I grab Aaron Jones in the first round, I want Tony Pollard. I want A.J. Dillon in the ninth or tenth round. Okay. I don't care what your upside philosophy is. This is what I want to be doing. Okay. So when you're in the middle picks, when you're in picks five through eight, there's a good chance that your first round running back is going to be Zeke or Aaron Jones. So your ninth or 10th pick should be Tony Pollard or, or AJ Dillon. For a good example, Aaron Jones left yesterday's practice with a hamstring injury. You probably wanted to fucking own AJ Dillon if you didn't, if you already drafted, right? Like here, it's a really, really cool sentiment to say draft other people's handcuffs. But guess what? If you drafted Aaron Jones already, if you already had your draft and you didn't draft AJ Dillon, you pretty much just lost your fucking league. I'm not saying it, but in relativity, if Aaron Jones' injury was serious, you'd be in big trouble. It's a minor hamstring pull from everything that I know. Again, we have a full month to have him healthy and get ready for the beginning of the season. So I'm not worried about it right now. You know, if it's three weeks from now and he's still not practicing at all, we can we can uh, start the warrior alarms. But for right now, those are the guys that you want to be handcuffing and they are in the middle picks of the first round. So uh, basically we handcuffed him and then we took Gus, who's going to give us points, you know, regardless at the RB three or flex position. And then again, with a guy like Trey Lance, we don't know when he's going to start. I think there's a good chance that he starts relatively early into the season, but grab someone safe behind him so that you know you're getting 16, 18 points per game while you're waiting for Lance to get into your lineups. Kirk Cousins is fine. Baker Mayfield is fine. Any of these guys down here are fine. So that is what I'd be doing at the quarterback position if I don't grab Kyler in the fifth round, if I don't grab you know one of those premium quarterbacks earlier on in the middle round. So look at the final roster. We have Trey Lance and or Kirk Cousins as our quarterback. We have Zeke, Najee Harris, Damian Harris, Tony Pollard, Gus Edwards as our running back. So we have two solidified RB1s. We have Darren Waller, a high-end tight end one. We have four really, really solid wide receivers. And I cut off at round 12 because once you're down here, it's just kind of like get your fucking guy, um, get your fucking shine box, throw them into your lineups. And uh, and this was the first draft. I really like this draft. And as we go through them, let me know what your favorite strategy was or what your favorite picks were, Your favorite, uh, what your favorite draft ended up being. Let's jump into the second one. Here, I kind of did the same start. Right. I, I went with Aaron Jones instead of Zeke. I know the injury news again. It's, it's just more strategy, not so much like player based. But I wanted to, you know, a lot of a lot of you guys are going to get enamored with the shiny names, the the wide receivers that are so high end elite that it's going to be tough for you to pass on. So I wanted to, you know, and even Stefan Diggs at like the two six is 
pretty beautiful pick as the wide receiver five. So I couldn't help myself here. So we went with a little bit of a different strategy. We went with Aaron Jones in the first running back first. So this is kind of like a compromised zero running back situation where you take your one running back that anchors your team. And then you just go with a bunch of wide receivers. You get your quarterback early and uh, let it play out from there. So Aaron Jones and then Stefan Diggs sitting there in the second round. We went with Terry McLaurin in the third round. I could have went with Waller there, uh, but I decided to switch it up at the two six. You know, we could have went with Antonio Gibson, uh, Clyde Edwards Hilaire, but I think Diggs is, you know, head and heels above those guys. Had I not gone with Diggs or Calvin Ridley, who would be my next up, I would have went with Antonio Gibson because I do think he gives you league winning upside. But again, I wanted to try out different strategies. Now, here's the problem. Once we get to three seven, you're stuck with, again, a low end wide receiver, one high end wide receiver, two and shitty running backs because after Diggs, Clyde, Gibson, Montgomery, DeAndre Swift, J.K. Dobbins, Chris Carson, who were the next running backs that I would have been glad to pick at 3-7, went off the board. And this is where things get dicey, okay? And I think I want to talk about this a little bit more in the next draft, so I won't go too much into it. But this was a wide receiver heavy strategy that I went with. Diggs, McLaurin, CeeDee Lamb, Tyler Lockett. The problem with this type of strategy is is you start to realize really quickly how much value there is at wide receiver. It becomes a really, really slippery slope, right? You go, oh my God, Diggs is available in the middle second. Oh man, Terry's available in the third. Oh man, CeeDee Lamb's available in the fourth. Oh man, Tyler Lockett's available in the fifth. Oh man, Ayuk's available in the sixth. Oh man, fucking, you know, Devonta Smith, Antonio Brown, Debo Samuel available in the seventh, eighth, ninth round. You just start to take that best player available and it fucks up your entire draft. It, it fucks up your team. It fucks up your starting roster, okay? Because you just find yourself taking more. Before you know it, you have five wide receivers on your team because there's so much value to be had there, and you only have one running back. And uh, in the sixth round, I went with a quarterback to pair with Lockett, right? We like to stack, obviously. But it's not like I had a lot of choice at, at, at running back in the middle of the sixth round. Like, do I want to take Mostert there? No. Do I want to take Javante Williams there? Not really, no, because I'm down on him this year. James Robinson, Ronald Jones. I like Damian Harris, but middle of the sixth round, I feel like is a little, uh, a little spicy, a little early. You're left sitting there with the roster without a real RB2. Do I like Trey Sermon? Yes. I think his upside is very real. I think he'll be one of the top rookie running backs this year. But there's a chance that he doesn't get more than, you know, 10 to 12 touches a game until week 10. And at that spot, you're putting your, yourself in a really big hole at the running back position. Michael Carter, A.J. Dillon, right? Handcuffed for Aaron Jones. It, it puts you in a situation where your running backs really, really hurt. And they're the most important position in fantasy football. So, yes, this strategy can work. And you're going to have a nice, shiny-looking team with big names. But big names in real NFL don't always transfer to big points in fantasy football. That is the, uh, I would call this strategy the slippery slope strategy. I think anyone who's gone wide receiver early knows that it's really tough to continue to passing up on wide receivers because there's so much fucking value at the position as you enter the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh round. So I could have taken Antonio Gibson in the second round and still ended up with Terry McLaurin or Allen Robinson, Mike Evans as my wide receiver one. And still, you know, I could have grabbed Kyler Murray in the fourth round and then still grabbed Tyler Lockett. Brandon Ayuk, uh, whatever, you know, your pick of guys in the sixth round, seventh round, and had a really solid group of wide receivers still. Uh, so that that's that's the problem here. And tight end, um, tight end we just waited on. We'll probably, if we don't hit on any of the early ones, like if I took Darren Waller in the third, obviously I wouldn't be taking another tight end. But since I didn't, I will take Hawkinson gladly in like the sixth or seventh round, but has to fall to me at value. I don't hate Kyle Pitts there at the 5-5, five, five actually. Uh, Mark Andrews, I feel like, is a bad pick at the top of the tier of that round. Dallas Goddard seems to be like the single worst pick, in my opinion, in fantasy football at the tight end position right now. He's like head and heels above that tier of tight ends when he has not proven to be that guy. As long as Zach Ertz is there, as long as the veterans are there taking targets, he's just never going to hit his ceiling. And people act like Dallas Goddard should be in the Hawkinson tier when basically every run, every tight end that's going below Goddard and going a little bit above him has outmatched him in his career highs. Like last year, Dallas Goddard set career highs across the board. And there were about 12 to 15 tight ends that topped him in targets, receptions, and receiving yards. We're, we're putting this hypothetical upside on Dallas Goddard that I don't think he has and does not warrant him to be the top tight end of that tier, especially while Zach Ertz is still there. So yeah, I don't know. This strategy was okay. A lot of shiny names. Uh, it'll make your starting lineup look good. I just don't think it's a, a real league winning lineup in my opinion. We'll move over to the third strategy. And this is where we went with a wide receiver in the first round. You know, some of your leagues are going to play out this way where they start off you know, not this exact setup, but in a realistic league, I could see some of my leagues starting off. We went with the 108 here to probably give you guys the most realistic strategy if you needed to go wide receiver early on. So Dalvin Cook, C-Mac, 
Derrick Henry, Kamara, if you want to throw Zeke in there, if you want to throw Aaron Jones in there, which I think is semi-realistic, and then maybe Saquon Barkley goes off the board, and you have no choice but to really take a wide receiver. You're either reaching up for a Nick Chubb or an Austin Eckler, which, listen, I'm not against it, but I feel like I'd rather just have Devontae Adams at that point. So I took Devontae Adams at the 1-8. A lot of you guys are going to take Devontae Adams if you're in the later round of the draft, and this is where it gets tricky. This is the strategy that I kind of brought up for a second last draft, okay? The second draft we just talked about. In the second round, you need to secure a running back. You can start with Devontae Adams and Metcalf or Devontae Adams and Calvin Ridley, and that's a stellar start. It's a stellar start, but you are going to be absolutely fucked at running back in most situations. This is what I would call a gamble strategy. You are gambling that one of the running backs falls back to you in the third round. You are gambling that Clyde, Dobbins, Swift, Montgomery, or Carson falls back to you in the third round. Because if they do not, If you start off with two wide receivers, or if you go with a wide receiver in the first round, don't secure a top high-end RB1, you are gambling that one of those guys falls back to you in the third. And who knows, maybe in like more friendly family leagues, a guy like Mixon or a guy like Gibson does fall back to you at the 3-8, 3-7 or whatever. I'm not banking on it from a strategy standpoint though. So when you're in this position at the 2-5, like even you could see it here, like Najee Harris, you like Najee Harris and you think he's going to get an 85% opportunity share, but realistically, you know, how, how great do you feel with him as your RB1? I feel good. I feel fine. Like it's going to be volume, but I don't think he's a league winning type running back. So you're passing up on league winning upside with not taking a Zeke or an Aaron Jones or whoever falls to you there at the running back position and settling with Najee Harris. I got really lucky here that Chris Carson did fall to me at the 3-8. But again, I think it's like a 50-50 coin flip that a real RB2 falls to you at the 3-8. We don't want Sanders. We don't want Jacobs. We don't want Kareem Hunt. So Carson fell to me at the 3-8. Then the next pick, Darrell Henderson fell to me at the 4-5. He's not a third round pick that I want to invest in, but he is a fourth round pick I can get behind. Again, I think he's a rock solid RB2 that will have RB1 type weeks. There's absolutely risk there. If they do just force a running back by committee, it gets a little bit ugly. So I went three running backs off the rip. I'm fine with that because we already have our high end wide receiver one locked up. Harris, Carson, Henderson. Again, we have multiple flexes so we can throw any of those running backs in there. Lockett in the fifth round. Ayuk in the sixth round. Damian Harris, seventh round. Now, an interesting strategy here is this. Like in the seventh round, I had the choice of going with Damian Harris or Aaron Rodgers. We could have stacked Aaron Rodgers with Devontae Adams. And then Robert Tunyon, who I took in the ninth, who Robert Tunyon is a guy that I am telling you guys to draft everywhere as the tight end. He is the guy, if you don't grab a tight end early, Robert Tunyon in the ninth, 10th round is who you want to be targeting. Don't fucking ask me questions about it. Don't at me. Robert Tunyon is your boy. I, I like how this draft turned out so far. I actually really, 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 really like it. I don't know if this is realistic, though. I don't know. You have to have a lot of luck in order for your draft to turn out this way if you're going to go out with a wide receiver in the first round. Again, this could turn into a slippery slope situation where you go with Devontae Adams, then you go with Calvin Ridley, and before you know it, if Chris Carson doesn't fall back to you, you're kind of either reaching for Miles Sanders or or, uh, Darrell Henderson, or you're just settling for Terry McLaurin and Allen Robinson. Before you know it, again, you have four or five wide receivers on your team before you have like a good running back. Slippery slope strategy. I think you're gambling on this when you take this strategy. Adams, Lockett, Ayuk, Harris. I decided to go with Harris over Rodgers because a breakout running back is way more valuable than a quarterback that's not Kyler Murray, Patrick Mahomes, or Josh Allen in a one quarterback league, okay? Rodgers is going to regress in the touchdown department. He's still going to be fine. He's still going to be a very good quarterback one, probably like quarterback six to eight or whatever, but that doesn't separate you in a one quarterback league whatsoever. So I decided to go with the running back. Obviously, Rodgers was picked next. Antonio Brown, another guy that I'm telling you guys to draft everywhere. We locked up our fourth wide receiver. So we have four running backs, four wide receivers up to this point. Took my boy Tanyan, who I love. And then again, if you're in a one quarterback league, you want upside at the QB position. Every quarterback this late with upside also comes with risk. Trey Lance, one of those, because we don't know when he's going to start. But you want him in the 11th, 12th round of one quarterback leagues and followed up with another quarterback. Ideally, your starting QB wouldn't be Fitzpatrick. I was hoping that I could have gotten Baker Mayfield or Kirk Cousins there uh, as my QB2, who would actually be my QB1 for the start of the season. Uh, Maybe, you know, maybe you don't go with Elijah Moore in the 11th round. And instead, you take Trey Lance in the 11th round and make sure that you lock up a Kirk or a Baker behind him. So let those guys start for the first three, four, five weeks. You know, I would say, I don't have off the top of my head, but check the schedules of the guy of the quarterbacks being drafted quarterbacks like 12 through 20. Whoever has the best schedule to start off the year, uh, who you will be starting until Trey Lance gets into the lineup, is probably the guy that you want to go with. Again, I don't have that off the top of my head, but this is what I'd be doing if I don't grab a quarterback early, which as you could see in none of these drafts I actually did, because in the middle the middle picks, it doesn't seem like you're getting the guys like Kyler or Lamar Jackson falling to you where you would ideally want to take them. So I'm not reaching up for quarterbacks in a one quarterback league, but if they fall to me, I have no problem taking them at the end of the fourth, early fifth, which is where yesterday's video comes into play for it. So yeah, that's really the strategy for the one quarterback leagues, right? You can go with three strategies we had were running backs early and often, 
We ended up with Zeke, Harris, Damian Harris, uh, CeeDee Lamb, Lockett, Ayuk, Darren Waller, which I really like because that Darren Waller in the third round is juicy. I don't imagine it's going to happen too often, so I, I don't know if I'd bank on the tight end being there. You'd end up with a different wide receiver one. kind of Your team looks a little more boring if you go Allen Robinson there over a Darren Waller, but you could always go David Montgomery there too if you like him. Uh, grab a third running back who's in your flex spot, which is pretty sexy. So running backs early and often is my favorite team here. Um, this is another sexy looking team, but again, the slippery slope, usually fucks you at the running back position. So be weary of that if you do go with wide receivers early. Same thing here. You need some luck here to lock up that running back position, which is, again, I can't emphasize this enough. The way the fantasy football leagues are set up, unless the points or roster starting settings are skewed so heavily towards wide receiver, they just have very, 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 very little positional value in your leagues, right? When we're talking about player analysis, we're going to be right on 50% of our shit. We're going to be wrong on 50% of our shit when we're trying to project who's a better pick, running back 12 or running back 13 for ADP, right? I don't know. Is Najee Harris or Clyde edwards Slayer going to do better this year? Realistically, I have no fucking idea. I'm going to take Najee Harris over Clyde, but I could very well be wrong. But when you look at the actual strategy and the game theory behind things, we do have stats, we do have numbers, we do have positional value, positional scarcity in our playbook. And that's what we need to be looking at. So when we have those advantages that we know are true, not that we, you know, we, we think we could project players, but we can't. We fucking stink at it, okay? So that's not where you want to be trying to get your edge. You don't want to be trying to get your edge because you know that one player is better than the other because you don't. You fucking don't. But what you do know is that running backs are more valuable than wide receivers. High-end running backs are more valuable than high-end wide receivers, et cetera, et cetera, down the list. All right, so let's jump into the super flex drafts. So we have two drafts here that I wanted to start out with. I didn't waste my time going through a, a super flex draft where I'm going with wide receiver first or early because that that just will never be a strategy I can get behind. So if you guys want to do it, by all means, have fun finishing in sixth place or whatever. But with super flex strategies, um, running backs and Q QBs are just so fucking valuable that you cannot skip on them. Again, y'all, if you're new to the channel, please uh, consider subscribing. Please, 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 please. I'm fucking broke. I need y'all to subscribe. Again, tomorrow is going to be picks nine through 12. So if you don't want to miss that, you have to be subscribed. Turn the noties on. A little nude noties on. I tell you what, I hate. I kind of hated sparkling water and seltzer until about three months ago, and now I cannot stop drinking this shit. It's like straight up black cherry sparkling water, lime sparkling water, seltzer. Is just like fucking. It's like the meme. You take water and you smash the upgrade button and you get seltzer. I'm not sure why I hated it for so long. I thought it was like a, a, a fake type of water. I started actually started Googling this shit last night. I was like, does sparkling water hydrate? It, it's one of those things that I feel like has become too good to be true. You know, it's like, oh, there's got to be a catch. I was like, does it actually hydrate you like regular water? And it makes, I mean, I'm just fucking water, so it should. And uh, I read some shit, you know, again, I'm only technically a doctor, but I read some uh, some doctor input, some blog posts from doctors. Imagine being a fucking doctor and blogging. That would stink. Anyways, they were saying, yeah, it hydrates you as much as regular water. Uh, it just takes a little bit longer for it to hit you in the hydration. So when I wake up, first thing I do, one of my uh, one of one of my slogans in life is always hydrate before you caffeinate. If you can't tell, I caffeinate to devilish levels. I caffeinate more than any man should caffeinate, any man or woman. If a woman caffeinated to the level I did, they might fucking pass away immediately. But you should hydrate before you caffeinate in the morning. Okay. Very, very important to do so. You should hydrate with normal water because, again, carbonated water, seltzer water takes a little bit longer for you to hydrate. You should also wait like an hour or two before you have your first coffee. That has to do with cortisol and all that shit, but I'm not here to talk about cortisol. I'm here to talk about quarterbacks. You know what I'm saying? Playing the same as All right. Let's, let's jump into Superflex Strategy Team 1. Uh, in the middle rounds of the first, if you are picking at, you know, 1-5, one, 1-8, one, you're going to get your selection of, a, of an elite quarterback there, almost for sure. Right. So I love Kyler Murray. He's my quarterback, too. He's not very far behind Patrick Mahomes here. So I said, OK, let's fuck around and see what this strategy does for us by taking a top end quarterback. And I, I got to tell you, this team turned out sexy. This team turned out sexy beyond belief. Kyler Murray at the one seven. And since it's a super flex league, you're going to have a lot of the skill players pushed back pretty significantly. I don't think Aaron Jones will ever, ever, ever fall to the two six. But, you know, in the same vein, again, this is strategy not player analysis video. So like Austin Eckler would probably be there at the two six and I'd be fine with Austin Eckler there. So we went Kyler and then we just ran off running backs, Aaron Jones, Joe Mixon, Chris Carson, Darrell Henderson, all at values in my humble ass opinion, realistic. I don't know. You guys fucking decide, but you're going to have a lot of quarterbacks go off the board early in super flex league, which does push all these skill players back. Maybe not mixing there, but I, I can almost guarantee you, you're going to get a guy like Dobbins there or Clyde or Chris Carson there. And I'd be completely happy with that. We got Joe Mixon because he's my highest ranked running back out of those guys. 
And then Chris Carson fell to us two and a fourth. So again, if you have four flex spots, I am completely fine drafting running back, running back, running back, running. You can never have too many running backs because some of your running backs are going to bust. Some of your running backs are going to get hurt. But as long as you have a couple high-end ones, they are going to anchor your team. And we have Kyler Murray to start it off. Beautiful. This is almost, again, a little bit like the gambling thing because when you take the quarterback first, you're gambling that you you get a nice running back two in the, in the third. But in a super flex league, you're very, very likely to get a, a nice, nice running back two in the third round. So you could have said, okay, I want Kamara as my uh, my QB1, taking Russ at 2-6, and you could have Kamara, Joe Mixon, Russ, or Kyler, Aaron Jones, Mixon. I would personally take Murray, Jones, Mixon over the, the other two. Uh, so we waited until the sixth round to draft our first wide receiver, and honestly, I could have waited another round. I don't give a fuck about wide receivers in Superflex leagues. I'll get this question a lot. Is it worth taking two high-end quarterbacks in Superflex? My opinion is absolutely not. I'd also like to say if you're in a smaller league, the smaller your league gets within Superflex, the less important it is to draft your second quarterback. Okay, the high end quarterbacks will still have the positional advantage. But if you're in a 10 team league and 18 league, there's always going to be quarterbacks available at the end of the draft or even on the waiver wire. Even if they're shitty quarterbacks, you're going to be able to grab a guy like Sam Darnold. You're going to be able to grab a guy like I don't know who's left on the board. Guys like that. Sam Darnold, Ben Roethlisberger, guys you don't want to start, but are perfectly fine giving you 15 to 17 points in the quarterback two position. Okay, so the smaller your team league is, the more important it is to fade the second quarterback. The bigger your league is 14, 16 teams, you have to be hitting quarterbacks early and often. I would really, really suggest you leave your draft with at least three quarterbacks. And I took a a similar approach to what I did in the one quarterback league where I want a safe QB2 and then Trey Lance as another quarterback. So I'm fine using a premium pick when I don't even have my starting lineup in place when you can get a, a guy like Trey Lance in the sixth, seventh, eighth round because his upside is going to be massive. And if you anchor your team with two RB1s, three RB1s, and two... QB ones in a super flex league, you're pretty, pretty fucking set. And you guys know how I am. And I, I am on Antonio Brown. So him is my wide receiver two. fine with it. Michael Gallup is my wide receiver three. Again, I'm not really too concerned with the wide receiver two and three production. They're all giving you about the same amount of points per game. And again, you guys can argue that it does matter who your wide receiver two is. The point being is that like, again, it goes back to when you're drafting, when you're on the clock, you're picking be- between wide receiver 18, 19 and 20 in the ADP. You're not good at choosing the right one. I'm telling you that straight up. I'm not good at it. Your favorite fan, Evan Silva, not good at it. Matthew Berry, not good at it. I'm not good at it. You're not good at it. So yes, at the end of the year, yes, it's important to have a fucking high-end wide receiver one, right? But when you're drafting, you're not going to be able to choose who that is. Last year in rookie drafts, do you know how many people took Jalen Rager over Justin Jefferson? Denzel Mims over Justin Jefferson, Denzel Mims over Brandon Ayuk, Chase Claypool, T. Higgins. Every single league had that. Y'all fuck up. We all fuck up on player analysis. So take the game theory strategy away from this stuff, okay? Superflex is quarterbacks, it's running backs. However you want to dice up the first three to four rounds, it should be specifically for those players. I do like to grab one high-end quarterback one, and then the way I look at quarterbacks is whoever you're comfortable starting as a quarterback in your one QB league should be the same comfort level that you have as your quarterback two in a super flex league. So I love how this team turned out. We have Kyler, Kirk Cousins, or Trey Lance, Aaron Jones, Mixon, Carson, Darrell Henderson, Cooper Cup, Antonio Brown, Michael Gallup. And then again, at the wide, uh, tight end position, I like Irv Smith. You know, there's been some negative connotations towards him this off season. I think he'll be fine. I think he'll be a baller. And I stacked him with Kirk Cousins. And I also just love Jonu Smith. I loved Jonu before the Hunter Henry news. I had Jonu Smith as a must draft player in the... BDGE draft guide, which will be hopefully out by the time you guys are watching this. Uh, I'm hoping it's dropping within the next two to three days, hopefully out by this weekend, BDGE.store. Let's move over to the second uh, strategy we had in Superflex, which was running back heavy, 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 which I don't hate. It's, It's actually like super, super similar to the last strategy, honestly, except I just wanted to pair more high end running backs. Ended up going Kamara at six, Eckler at two, seven, Gibson at three, six. Brady was my first quarterback off the board at four, seven. Uh, Henderson at five six. This time I took Lance at the six in the six uh, in the sixth round, which I think will probably be more realistic. I think as we move closer to the beginning of the season, we're going to see Lance hype hit new levels, and he's going to go earlier and or- earlier in Superflex League. But again, that's fine. I took Lance there, and then I said, "Fuck it. Uh, I don't need a Kirk Cousins. I don't need a Baker Mayfield. I don't need one of those guys anchoring me at the QB two spot. We'll settle for a guy like Derek Carr. Like Derek Carr in a points per game basis was not very far behind Mayfield or Kirk Cousins. So I was fine with Carr as my QB two. Um, and then we stacked those middle round wide receivers: T. Higgins, 
who's an extreme value at 7-6, Debo Samuel, Antonio Brown. That's the, that's the point I keep trying to get across to you guys. You can't get running backs that you're comfortable starting in the 7th, 8th round, but you can easily get wide receivers that you're comfortable there. So uh, the top end of my team is sexy. Kamara, Eckler, Gibson. I would I would argue all three of those guys have league winning upside. Brady, Trey Lance, Derek Carr. Obviously, the quarterbacks aren't as sexy as last round when I took Kyler Murray, Trey Lance, and Kirk Cousins, but it's a give and take. High-end RBs versus... Uh, high-end quarterbacks. I love how this strategy turned out. So I like both of them. I like middle rounds. If you're a super flex, the one thing I would just stay away from, stay away from the shiny names at wide receiver. Stay away from the shiny names at wide receiver. They're not as valuable. And there's, it's going to put you in a hole at the positions that are valuable. And that is running back, that is quarterback. And that is it for today's video. So let me go back to full screen. Let me know uh, which strategies you enjoy the most, which ones you are going to be taking this year, which you think are worth uh, digging into a little bit more. Maybe I'll do a couple more strategy videos as the summer goes on, but tomorrow will be strategies nine through 12. All right. Picks nine through 12, which I don't think will be very different than what you saw in today's video, which I think was probably the most helpful video, hopefully for you guys. If you enjoyed, make sure you hit the thumbs up button, subscribe to the channel. If you are new, go check out the draft guide, bdge.store. If you go there right now, it is not set up to be the full draft guide. It is not live. It is not published. We're revamping the entire website. That will be hopefully live by this weekend. The rankings are up on that site though. I love y'all. I'll see you tomorrow. Motherfucking goodbye.